So I was put in a car and we just drove the road up there, but I had to be disguised as a Yemeni woman, so full face veil, so that they wouldn't know that a Western journalist was making it into the rebel-held areas. It's the last stand in a seven-year civil war. Rebel fighters cornered inside Idlib province. The final piece of Syria's chessboard. While the big players weigh their options, millions of lives remain at stake. Hi, I'm Ian Bremmer, and welcome to G-Zero World. I'll take you inside the minds of major powers who are vying to end this bloody conflict one way or another. Then I'll sit down with PBS NewsHour correspondent Jane Ferguson. She just got back from three months in Yemen. And of course, I have your puppet regime. But first, a word from the folks who help us keep the lights on. Syria. It's home to a civil war that's been raging for years. It's a topic you've likely heard a lot about, but now the war may be entering its final stage, and the stakes are brutally high. Idlib province. The last remaining rebel stronghold of the Syria war. For weeks, the world has watched with anticipation as Syrian President Bashar al-Assad used his troops, backed by Russian air power, to corner the rebels who have dug in for a final stand. But Assad's forces haven't finished them off. Why? There's a deal in the works. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan is playing the broker. And the lives of nearly three million men, women, and children who live in Idlib, it's a large city, hang in the balance. Unfortunately, there's no guarantee this truce will last. That will depend on whether a scattering of rebel groups, which together make up tens of thousands of fighters, will lay down their weapons or fight to their bitter end. If the battle for Idlib begins, it will likely be the war's last major confrontation. A conflict that has already killed or made refugees of half of Syria's population. That's over 10 million people. For many survivors, it's inflicted irreversible psychological damage. As for Idlib, Assad wants to avoid a bloodbath if he can, but he also wants to take back full control of his country, and his patients may be wearing thin. This is Syria we're talking about, so there are plenty of other parties to consider. To begin to understand this war, let's look at the outside players. First, there's Iran, Assad's main regional ally. Its government, opposed by some hostile Arab neighbors, particularly Saudi Arabia and the UAE, wants to see the Islamist groups, rebel militias, and other Assad enemies crushed. But its leaders are also watching to be sure Russia, Assad's other reliable ally, doesn't muscle Tehran out of the way. That brings us to Russia's Vladimir Putin. He wants to expand his country's influence in the Middle East. He's looking to avoid a bloody battle in Idlib that would further alienate Europe and make it more difficult to raise funds to rebuild Syria. Russia is, for the moment, supporting Turkey's bid for a truce. But like Assad and like Iran, Putin is ready to end this war, and his patience, too, isn't unlimited. Next is Turkey. President Erdogan really wants to avoid an all-out final battle in Idlib because Turkey's economy has more than enough problems now without another surge of refugees. They already have 3.5 million Syrians in makeshift camps in Turkey, and a full-on fight in Idlib would send another tidal wave of desperate Syrian civilians scrambling toward Turkey's border. Watching closely are European leaders, especially those who lead countries that also house big numbers of migrants, and that's politically unpopular there. Whatever their opinions of Assad's savagery, the Europeans know that reconstruction of Syria can't begin until Syria's strongman gets a hold of his country. Only then can some of the Syrians now living in Europe return home, easing the pressure on European politics. The bottom line is that the fate of Syria isn't just left to the Syrians. And if you're from Yemen, that might sound all too familiar.
And now for our interview. Let's talk about Yemen. It's been a forgotten war, a nation plagued by civil strife and intruding foreign powers. It's the worst humanitarian crisis in the world, according to the United Nations. And PBS NewsHour correspondent Jane Ferguson recently traveled to the war-torn nation, spent some three months there. Now here's the rest of our conversation. I'm delighted to have Janie Ferguson, special correspondent from PBS NewsHour, here with me. Janie, great to be with you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So you were smuggled in to Yemen. Uh, my grandmother uh, used to tell me that she was rolled up in the carpet uh, in the back of a truck when she was taken out of Syria. Is that kind of the way it wow. worked for you or not really? Well, I was kind of rolled up in a local Yemeni dress. Um, I was I was able to legally enter southern Yemen, and then I was essentially smuggled to the north. So I was put in a car, and we just drove the road up there, but I had to be disguised as a Yemeni woman, so full face veil, so that they wouldn't know that a Western journalist was making it into the rebel-held areas. Now, I mean, I know that you've done this before for part of your living, right? I mean, Mosul, front lines, war against ISIS, but uh, you don't look like a Yemeni woman. I, I, is it, are you a little petrified every time you do something like this? A little bit, for sure. I think if you weren't scared, you'd be a bit dangerous to yourself. So I do find it frightening, but I, I, I'm always reminded that I'm going somewhere for a specific reason. And this is a story that I have been passionate about and wanting to report for well over two years. This has been hit and miss, trial and error, trying to get in. And so whenever it came, comes to the one day where you have to do something dangerous like that, you're focused and ready. It's one of the worst humanitarian crises in the world today. Why do you think it's not getting the coverage? The UN says it is the worst, and that is because of the statistics. We're talking two-thirds of the country that can't feed itself by itself. Um, the reason it's not getting the coverage is very uh, simple, and that is because attempts to keep journalists out and block journalists from reporting this story have been very successful. Saudi Arabia, of course, uh, an ally of the United States. How does the US government feel about you doing this? I don't know. They haven't said. Mm. But I would say that there is a certain inconvenient truth to the pictures that are coming out of the North. Because the truth is that the, the US government is helping a military coalition that is on one side of a war. And as long as the war goes on, people will continue to starve. And this could even turn into a full-blown official famine. Before we get into what's happening in Yemen, why do you think the United States has been so indifferent and arm's length to what the UN says is the worst humanitarian crisis in the world? It comes down to their relationship with the Saudis, effectively, who are, who are running this coalition, this military coalition, uh, aiding Yemeni groups on the ground, fighting rebels that they believe are heavily backed by and involved with Iran. So it comes down to the side that the United States finds itself on in the regional geopolitics that's going on. It is that relationship with the Saudis. Now, it's very difficult to address the humanitarian concerns on the ground without holding to account the behaviors of those involved in this war, including, and as it happens because of the blockade, more so even the, uh, the Saudi role in terms of the hunger. The economic blockade that's preventing um, the Yemen from growing. Effectively, the economic blockade has collapse the economy in the north. So it is a, a blockade where you know, aid can come in through the World Food Program, the United Nations, but people can't make a living. So people can no longer afford to buy food. And that's what the crux of the crisis really is. But let's talk a little bit about the war in Yemen itself. Um, I mean, to the extent that you hear headlines about it, it is portrayed as proxy war between the Saudis and allies and the Iranians. How true and how much of a simplification is that on the ground? On a geopolitical regional scale, it is true that the Saudis are, of course, backing one side and the Iranians support the other side. But on the ground, it is also very much so a Yemeni war. It's about Yemeni interpolitics. This happened as a, as a result further down the line from the Arab Spring, from the Yemeni dictator who'd been in power for more than 30 years, Ali Abdullah Saleh, was removed from power. And what you had was something of a house of cards effect, where the, the tribes and the more powerful uh, families then basically split 
apart and there were schisms within the way Yemen was traditionally run. So um, the Yemeni economy was not exactly going anywhere before this conflict started. In fact, many described it as one of the biggest impending crises, no water, nothing that they produced. Um, I mean, how, what does it look like now on the ground? It's a, it's a much, much worse version of exactly what you describe. Yemen was the poorest country in the Middle East. I mean, Yemen was what we often would say, you know, was, was as poor as many African nations. And uh, we've seen hunger crises there before. So, you know, it was a very hungry place, a place that was very vulnerable to this level of hunger. The capital had no water huge water shortages, a mismanaged economy, importing well over 80% of their own food. But what has happened really as a result of this conflict is that food prices have gone up. And you've seen before the, the war, the largest employer was the state. And the state stopped paying salaries for everybody in the North. Over a million people, overnight, their income disappeared. And those people are, you know, each supporting perhaps a dozen other people. So you're talking millions and millions of people. The family size is very, very large in Yemen. Big families. And also, if one member of a family has a job with the government, a steady monthly income, that's, that's hugely valuable. And many people will be reliant on that. And so what you're seeing now when you're in the street is just a huge amount of destitution. Beggars, not just in the streets in the city, but if you're driving in the country roads, you'll see the destitute by the side of the road begging, even in the most remote mountain areas. You'll see people in the markets selling their own furniture. What you're seeing are middle class families who have lost everything. Now, when that happens in a place like Syria or Venezuela, it's led to significant refugee crises. Why haven't more Yemenis gotten the hell out of there? Well, Yemenis are stuck. If you look at the geography, they're basically surrounded by the uh, nations of the coalition. So to the north, they share a huge uh, border with the Saudis. And then to the east, they're, they're basically bordering Oman. But also, the oceans are not safe. There used to be, and there still are, some Somalis trying to make it into Yemen on uh, refugee boats because they're trying to get to Saudi Arabia. It hasn't gone the other way because the airstrikes hit these boats. So, so you're saying that right Right now, Yemen is actually a destination for migrants from Somalia still? You will. You'll see Somalis walking up the highways north from Aden, the main capital in the south, up to the north of the country because they're so desperate, they're willing to move through a war zone just to get out. So given that, um, if you are um, a Yemeni youth today, um, I mean, how many of them, in your view, you spent a few months down there, are becoming radicalized, are taking up arms, are, uh, and, and, and what is the intention for those that are? Depends entirely on where they are. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're in the north, the Houthis are pushing very, very hard to recruit. I mean, they're taking casualties in places like Hodeida and along the, the various uh, fighting fronts with the Saudis. So they're desperately trying to recruit people and they're approaching young men and extremely young. They've been criticized um, m many times over the years for recruiting children even. Um, they couch it in terms of a jihad. They say, you know, we're fighting the Americans, we're fighting uh, the uh, those who are supporting Israel. So from that perspective, they're recruiting youth. But in the South as well, the coalition, the UAE government and the Saudis, they they back various militias and fighting groups. There isn't any in in the South. Those fighting on the on the side of the coalition are not unified. These are various fighting groups, and they'll recruit young people for fighting, basically, so that they can have a meal and a very, very tiny income. And then, of course, you have Al-Qaeda. And Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, as they're known in Yemen, are the deadliest um, offshoot franchise uh, arm of Al-Qaeda globally. And they're benefiting hugely because chaos helps Al-Qaeda. It always has. And this is the ultimate chaos. Now, the Iranians are under an enormous amount of pressure, only going to grow uh, given what's happening to their economy post-U.S. withdrawal from the Iranian deal. Um, that's making them a little more militant and hardline in terms of the government, but it's also reducing their capabilities. How do you think that is likely to play out in terms of Iran's involvement in the Yemen war? Well, it depends on what the involvement is. If the involvement was to become expensive, then that would be something that would really be very sensitive back home in Tehran, of course, mm -hmm. because people don't want adventurism. They don't want anything that spa you know, basically smacks of wasting money on foreign adventures. However, for the 
the Iranians, with the decline of the economic situation for them, this has, as you've said, emboldened the hardliners. And the hardliners, for, for the first time in quite some time in Yemen, they do feel like they have perhaps got the Saudis on the back foot. I mean, this has been, the Saudis went into Yemen thinking that they would be able to defeat the Houthis within months. And that was years ago. From an Iranian perspective, you know, a foothold or at least a really strong relations with any Sana'a government would be a huge strategic coup. I mean, they're, they, they share such a massive border with the Saudis in Yemen. But it's important to remember that we still don't really know the military extent or the extent to the military cooperation. Now, of course, the Saudis say the Iranians are bringing in missiles, that Hezbollah is all along that border. There has been an exaggeration of, um, of the, uh, the, the cooperation because there hasn't been a huge amount of evidence to show that. But it is fairly, it is fair to say that it, it's likely that the Iranians are helping with those missiles. But you strikes. were there, so I'm wondering what kind of Iranian presence you were either able to see yourself or you were able to understand from the people you were talking. You certainly see a cultural affinity. When you go to these um, protests or rallies in Sana'a by the Houthi rebels, you'll see Hezbollah flags flying, you'll see pictures of Nasrallah and, you know, the certain Iranian, the, yeah. he, the leader of, of Hezbollah and Iranian leading figures as well. It's really important to point out that there isn't a direct religious affinity. There, there, there isn't sort of a Shia versus Sunni clear line in this war. The Houthis are, they're Zaidi Shias, which is specifically quite Yemeni, and they are not 12er Shias like the Iranians. They're, they're quite different, and they are not something that would have a direct religious affinity with uh, the Iranians themselves. But in Syria, we see a lot of Iranians on the ground, right? Fighters engaging with the military. Did you? We've not seen anything like that. You've seen literally no Iranians. When I've you're there. seen well, nobody that that I could identify as an Iranian. Absolutely not. Nobody told you, hey, that's an Iranian. They didn't no. like it. No. It's possible that they have Iranian. It's it's probably more likely they have Iranian advisors there, and they'll be not allowed anywhere near the streets of Sana'a or you know out in the open. But it is it is possible they have advisors helping groups like the Houthis perhaps learn from the experiences of those like Hezbollah in Syria, where they've learned to take a guerrilla force and turn them into more of a slightly more conventional army, or at least able to stand their ground against a conventional army. How do we even begin to get out of this quagmire? the only real progress will be talks, because both sides know they can't win militarily. Even the coalition know they're not going to march all the way up through the mountains to Sana'a. There is inevitably going to be a sit down and talks, but the, the talks will have to be in good faith. And um, right now, with the battle for Hodeida, basically- the port. Yeah, this is the main port uh, in the west of the country where all of the, the, most of the aid and food is coming in through. And that is currently controlled by the Houthis. And the coalition really want it. They want to be able to take that port, not just for, you know, a, a tactical reasons on the battlefield, but because that will put them in a much stronger position for those talks when they inevitably have to sit down with the Houthis and discuss the, the formation of some sort of uh, framework for peace and forming of a government. If they control Hodeida, then they'll be in a much stronger position and the Houthis will be on the back foot. So it's about trying- So they don't want talks until they're in a stronger position. Exactly. And, and the, the Saudis are unprepared to support that. The Saudis don't want to have be forced to the negotiating table before they've done everything they can mm -hmm. to take Hodeida. So let me talk about your trip personally uh, for a second. So you go in and you're smuggled in, in you know, sort of full hijab. Yes. You said that you know, you've been going and clearly a lot of people were happy to see coverage from an international journalist on the ground, but how comfortable are they with um, Western sensibilities, um, with a professional woman running a team, running around, clearly you're kind of an oddity for them. Um, was there, did you feel any level of discomfort, lack of safety as a consequence of that? Never really lack of safety because I'm a Westerner or because I'm a woman. Yemen is this incredibly polite society. People there are quite formal. Um, it's a very proud society as well. Interestingly, the whole time I was there, like nobody 
nobody wants to ask me for money. And, you know, Yemenis are too proud to beg, but they're also, they're very formal and they're very, you know, um, polite people. And so whenever you're dealing with them, you, I, I never felt like I had to deal with excessive levels of machismo, um, you know, difficult egos, you know, with, with, a, with a female person in charge of the team. To the extent that people have heard things about Yemen, one of the things that they have heard is cot, right? I mean, it's a good Scrabble word, it's got a Q, it doesn't involve <laughs> you. Um, and it's this mild narcotic, takes way too much water, and apparently all of the men in public are chewing it. And um, women, and in not public. Not in public, which is an interesting dynamic. But uh, so how does that affect um, interactions with people? productivity for those that have jobs? I mean, how, how much is that just a weird thing for you to deal with? Perhaps when I first started going, yeah. it was, but now cat is something you have to accept. It is so pervasive in the culture. It's like telling New Yorkers they're not allowed to have a cup of coffee. How does society work when they, a majority of the population is addicted to this thing? Well, cat can be, it can be chewed on the go. It's not like doing, you know, a heavy, heavy narcotic. Like, you know, you, 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 your driver will often be just chewing cut while he drives. Jenny Ferguson, glad you're back. Thank you. Hi, I'm Nabil, and I'm wondering, uh, what's the news with the refugee crisis in Yemen? Nabil, there's not really a refugee crisis coming from the Yemen conflict because they can't get out. Uh, Saudi Arabia is hostile territory. If they were found, uh, they would be rounded up and detained or worse. Otherwise, it's uh, getting out in waters infested by pirates and extremely dangerous. Uh, they're stuck, and that's one of the reasons that the cholera concerns there are getting bigger. It's a massive famine. It's an enormous humanitarian crisis. Places like Syria and Venezuela, they stream across the borders in Yemen. They stay and they deteriorate. Hi, I'm Sahil. Um, I'm wondering about the key issues between China and the U.S. in terms of trade. What are the underlying themes that are guiding negotiations between the White House um, and China? Sahil, there are a lot of themes that are guiding these discussions. Uh, the economic themes, first of all, like the trade imbalance between the United States that buys a lot of Chinese goods. The Chinese don't buy so much from the United States, so there's a trade deficit. There's questions of market access. The Americans cut off uh, the Chinese from investing in U.S. national security. Related sectors, the Chinese make it hard for the Americans to invest or own companies in all sorts of sectors. They don't have rule of law. There's stealing of intellectual property. The Americans have issues there, there's cyber. And then you have national security issues like territorial disputes over the South China Sea, the Americans providing arms for Taiwan, China doesn't like that. Cooperation on North Korea, are they gonna denuclearize? China is the country that has all the influence. And the United States and China need each other for lots and lots of things to get them resolved. But the American grievance list, as we heard from Vice President Pence the other day, make it sound like we're gearing for a divorce. So. Uh, there are many themes, and it's a challenging negotiation. Now for something completely different. President Donald Trump is pressing forward with a new branch of the U.S. military, and we've come across some rare footage. Roll tape. President Trump, you've proposed creating a special space force as a new branch of the U.S. military. Can you tell us how you imagine that? Captain's grade log, date 2019.4. We were busily exploring the Gangwon Nebula for new condo investment opportunities when we learned of a terrible problem. Zucker data, what is it? The personal data I've been monitoring says an asteroid is about to hit our community on Earth. A what? An asteroid? Collision with Earth will happen in There was less no than collusion with Earth, all right? No collusion. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, Donald. We must act. Please, that asteroid is just fake news. Exactly. Fake news is old Russian invention. What course shall I set for you now? Can you please not ask that in front of everyone like that? <laughs> Captain, uh, we're out of fuel. Well, running a spaceship on coal was highly illogical. You mean this is not a nuclear vessel? Damn, yeah. McConnell, get me McConnell. I need more power. I've already given you all the power I can, Mr. President. What more do you want? Wait, my data shows there's a nearby planet, all female. 
ages 20 to 25. The only aliens I truly love. We are saved, Zuckerberg. Make contact. What? What is it? Uh, they say that they cannot accept us. They have a strict no-refugees policy. A uh, what? Uh, Dr. Kim, how should we handle this? Damn it, Trump! I am a supreme leader, not a miracle worker! This is a disaster. Melania! Melania! Beam me up, Melania! Oh, Donald. I don't really care, do you? And that is our show this week. We will be right back here next week. Don't you miss it. Please don't miss it. I'm asking you, don't miss it. But in the meantime, if you like what you've seen, and I know you have, check us out on g0media.com. Thank you.